one of Kennedy's genius boys came up with the, because Kennedy's administration was run by a lot of Harvard graduates and Ivy League graduates, and so, you know, they were supposed to be pretty intelligent, but intelligence and wisdom are not the same thing. But anyways, um, they established a policy which was called mutual assured destruction, which means if you hit me, I kill you, and then you kill me. And so it'd be better if we just didn't bother. And the acronym was MAD, right? Mutual Assured Destruction. It's like, you know, just thinking about that, it, it's a chilling thought. It's like, what horrible entity thought that up as a joke? You know, you think, well, is that some, is that some politician's idea of wit? Like, where'd that come from? So that's a hell of a thing to make a joke about, you know? Mad, well, that was right, it was definitely mad. You know, and the, the, the odd thing is, is that we didn't blow ourselves up and we didn't have a third world war. And, you know, you, you can't make a solid claim that the invention of nuclear weapons was necessarily the worst thing that could have happened. You know, because even the Soviets who were completely insane, and of course the Maoists who were probably even worse, they weren't insane enough to start a nuclear war. Now, Stalin, there's evidence, there's debate about it, but there was ev there's evidence that Stalin was basically murdered, partly by Khrushchev, was, who, was his, who was his successor. Um, when Stalin died, Khrushchev and three other people were in his house, and what happened in Stalin's house the night he died is not clear. But I read a book recently called Stalin, interestingly enough, that was written by a guy who had access to the full Communist Party archives, you know, which was a relatively new thing, and that was his conclusion. And he also believed that Stalin was gearing up to do an, an invasion of Europe and that he didn't give a damn how many cities would have to be bombed in order for the Soviets to roll through. And Stalin, he was like that, you know. Stalin was perfectly capable of taking entire nations of people out in Eastern Europe by train and shipping them out to Siberia in the middle of the winter with nothing to eat and no tools and letting them live, which of course they didn't. And that meant women, children, men, you know, shorn of all their belongings and thrust out into the middle of nowhere to perish or, or, or live as they saw fit. And if they perish, so much the better as far as Stalin was concerned. And so he wasn't exactly the sort of person the idea of a nuclear war would necessarily stop. And it's certainly possible that that's what he was hoping for. You know, because when we look at people like Stalin and Hitler, we think, well, you know, they're after world domination. You know, and you think, well, in some sense, that's kind of a positive motivation, right? I mean, not really, but it's like if you have a Corvette, say, and someone steals it, you can think, well, I know why they stole it. They, they want to have the Corvette. You know, it's, it's an understandable motivation to want power. It's not necessarily an admirable one, although sometimes power is a perfectly well reasonable thing to pursue. But I don't have any idea why we ever assume that those guys were after victory. Like, you should never make the presupposition that everyone is out to win. Some people are out to lose. And the more people they can take with them, the better. You know, and when Hitler died, he committed suicide in a bunker way down below Berlin while Berlin was on fire and Europe was burning. It's like, as far as I can tell, that was exactly what Hitler was after right from the beginning. You know, he was interested in fire as a purifying agent. You know, he's a fire worshiper in some sense, because if you look at the Nuremberg gatherings of the Nazis, you know, they're spectacular, spectacular celebrations, unbelievably dramatic and impressive. And they frequently featured fire. And fire is a purifying agent, you know, and Hitler by the end of World War II was, he was pretty contemptuous of the Germans because they really hadn't served him well. Now, it wasn't like he thought, well, maybe it wasn't such a good idea to start a whole Second World War, you know, because he was a little on the narcissistic side, we might say. But by the time the Russians came marching in and Germany was in ruins, Hitler was perfectly happy to have the Allies tromp all over the citizens because that's what they deserved anyways. And so that's the sort of guy he was. And so why we would assume that he wanted to win just because that's what he said is something I've never been able to understand. You know, the kids who shot up Columbine didn't want to win. They wanted to kill as many people as possible to make a point, and then they wanted to kill themselves just in case you didn't exactly get the point. And the point was, the more destruction, the better. And if I have to go along with it, hey, no problem. That just makes me a little bit more serious than I might have otherwise been. And so those sorts of motivations are not pleasant to understand. But we have enough documentation about events like that, you know, especially the mass killings. Those guys have written down exactly why they do it. Now I have some excellent books on extraordinarily vengeful 
uh, mass serial killers and mass murders. I know exactly how they think. There's a great book, if you're interested in this sort of thing, called Panzram, P-A-N-Z-R-A-M. And Carl Panzram was a serial killer and rapist who lived pretty much early in the 20th century. And he was a tough, delinquent sort of kid from a large family. And when he was, you know, 13, 14, they sent him off to some reform school. And it was run by the same sort of people that run Canada's residential schools. And, you know, so those were basically predators on children. And of course, he was raped and, 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 and uh, brutalized and tormented in, in all sorts of horrible ways. And, but he was a tough guy. And when he came out, he decided that, you know, the human race really wasn't worth that much and that he was going to wreak as much mayhem as he possibly could for the rest of his life. He raped a thousand men. He killed dozens of people. He kept track of the dollar value of the buildings he burned down. Like this was a serious guy. And he was, he was bent on destruction. And that's that. What, his, what were his dying words? First of all, there was a committee, I believe, of women who intervened on behalf of him because they were anti-capital uh, punishment. And he said to them, if I remember correctly, that he wished the human race had one neck so that he could put his hands around it and squeeze. So, you know, that was his way of pointing out to the people who didn't think that maybe capital punishment was justified in his case, that maybe they weren't thinking clearly. And then to the hangman, he said, hurry up, you, who's your bastard? I could kill 10 men in the time it takes you to hang me. So, you know, you don't get a statement like that from someone who isn't thoroughly committed to what he's doing.